um, for us to use. So if you do use it, one of these data sets for any kind of project, it would be very, very nice uh, if you were to go and find the citation and say, you know, thanks to these people for this data set, okay? Because uh, they've, they've provided it, uh, and all they're asking in return is, is for us to give them that credit. Okay, so here is the Canva data set, here is the citation, and on our data sets page, that will link to the academic paper where it came from. Okay, Rachel, now is a good time for a question. Is there a way to use learn.lr find and have it return a suggested number directly rather than having to plot it as a graph and then pick a learning rate by visually inspecting that graph? And then there are a few other questions, I think, around more guidance on reading the learning rate finder graph. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a great question. The, I mean, the short answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because this is still a bit more artisanal than I would like. You know, as you can kind of see, I've been kind of saying, how I read this learning rate graph depends a bit on what stage I'm at and kind of what the shape of it is. Um, I guess like the, um, when you're just training the head, so before you unfreeze, um, it pretty much always looks like this. And you could certainly create something that kind of creates a slightly, you know, creates a smooth version of this, finds the sharpest ne negative slope and picked that, you would probably be fine nearly all the time. Um, but then for, you know, these kinds of ones, you know, it, it, it requires a certain amount of experimentation. Um, but the good news is you can experiment, right? You can, like, you can try. Obviously, if the line's going up, you don't want it. Um, almost certainly at the very bottom point, you don't want it, right? Because you need it to be going downwards. Um, but if you kind of start with somewhere around 10x smaller than that, and then also you could try another 10x smaller than that, try a few numbers and find out which ones, which ones work best. And within a small number of weeks, you will find that you're picking the best learning rate most of the time, right? So I don't know, it's kind of, so at this stage, it still requires a bit of playing around to get a sense of the different kinds of shapes that you see and how to respond to them. Maybe by the time this video comes out, someone will have a pretty reliable auto learning rate finder. Um, we're not there yet. Um, it's probably not a massively difficult job to do. Uh, be an interesting project. Uh, collect a whole bunch of different data sets. Maybe grab all the data sets from our um, data sets page. Try and come up with some simple heuristic, compare it to all the different lessons I've shown, um, that'd be a really fun project to do. Um, but at the moment, uh, we, we don't have that. Um, I'm sure it's possible, um, but we, we haven't got there. Okay, so um, how do we do image segmentation? Um, same way we do everything else. And, um, so basically, we're gonna start with some path which has got some information in it of some sort. So I always start by, you know, untiring my data, do an LS, see what I was given. In this case, there's a, label, uh, a folder called labels and a folder called images. So I'll create paths for each of those. We'll take a look inside each of those. And, you know, at this point, like, you can see there's some kind of coded file names for the images and some kind of coded file names for the segment masks. And then you kind of have to figure out how to map from one to the other. You know, normally these kind of data sets will come with a readme you can look at or you can look at their website. Um, often it's kind of obvious. In this case, I can see like these ones always have this kind of particular format. These ones always have exactly the same format with an underscore P, so I kind of when I did this, honestly, I just guessed. I thought, oh, it's probably the same thing, underscore P. And so I created a little function that basically uh, took the file name and added the underscore P um, and put it in a different place. And I tried opening it and it, I noticed it worked. So, you know, so I've created this little function that converts from the image file names to the equivalent label file names. I opened up that to make sure it works. Normally, we use open image to open a file, and then you can go .show to take a look at it. Um, but this, uh, as we described, this is not a usual image file. It contains um, integers. Um, 
So you have to use open mask rather than open image because we want to return int integers, not floats. And um, FastAI knows how to deal with masks. So if you go mask.show, it will automatically color code it for you in some appropriate way. That's why we said open mask. So, you know, we can kind of have a look inside, look at the data, see what the size is. So there's 720 by 960. Um, we can take a look at the data inside um, and so forth. Um, the other thing you might have noticed is that they gave us a file called codes.txt and a file called valid.txt. So codes.txt, we can load it up and have a look inside, and not surprisingly, it's got a list telling us that, for example, number four is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's building. Top left is building. There you go. Okay? So just like we had, you know, grizzlies, black bears, and teddies, here we've got the coding for what each one of these... Um, uh, pixels means. So we need to create a data bunch. So to create a data bunch, we can go through the data block API and say, okay, we've got a list of image files that are in a folder. We need to create labels, which we can use with that get y na fun file name function we just created. We then need to split into training and validation. In this case, I don't do it randomly. Why not? Because actually the pictures they've given us are frames from videos. So if I did them randomly, I would be having like two frames next to each other, one in the validation set, one in the training set. That would be far too easy. That's treating, right? So the people that created this data set actually gave us a data set saying, here is the list of file names that are meant to be in your validation set, and they're non-contiguous parts of the, of the video. So here's how you can split your validation and training using a file name file. Uh, so from that, I can create my um, data sets. And so I actually have a list of class names. So like often with stuff like the planet data set or the pets data set, we actually have a string saying, you know, this is a, this is a pug or this is a ragdoll or this is a burman or this is cloudy or whatever. In this case, you don't have every single pixel labeled with an entire string. That would be incredibly inefficient. They're each labeled with just a number and then there's a separate file telling you what those numbers mean. So here's where we get to tell it in the data block API, this is the list of what the numbers mean. Okay, so these are the kind of parameters that the data block API gives you. Uh, here's our transformations. And so here's an interesting point. Remember I told you that, for example, sometimes we randomly flip an image, right? What if we randomly flip the independent variable image but we don't also randomly flip this one. They're now not matching anymore, right? So we need to tell um, FastAI that I want to transform the Y. So, what, so X is our independent variable, Y is our dependent. I want to transform the Y as well. So whatever you do to the X, I also want you to do to the Y. So there's all these little parameters that we can play with. And I can create a data bunch. I'm using a smaller batch size because as you can imagine, because I'm creating a classifier for every pixel, that's going to take a lot more GPU, right? So I found a batch size of eight is all I could handle, uh, and then uh, normalize in the usual way. And this is quite nice. Um, FastAI, because it knows that you've given it a segmentation problem, when you call show batch, it actually combines the two pieces for you, and it will color code the photo. Isn't that nice? Right? So you can see here the green on the trees, and the red on the lines, and this kind of color on the walls, and so forth, right? So you can see here, here are the pedestrians. This is the pedestrian's backpack. So this is what the ground truth data looks like. So once we've got that, um, we can go ahead and um, uh, create a learner. I'll show you some more details in a moment. Uh, call LR find. Uh, find the sharpest bit, which looks about 1A neg 2, call fit, passing in slice LR, and see the accuracy, and save the model, and unfreeze, and train a little bit more. So that's the basic idea, okay? And so um, we're going to have a break, and when we come back, I'm going to show you um, some uh, little tweaks that we can do, and I'm also going to explain uh, this custom metric that we've created. Um, and then we'll be able to go on and look at some other cool things. So let's all come back at um, 8 o'clock, 6 minutes.
Okay, welcome back everybody, and we're going to start off with a question we got during the break. Could you use unsupervised learning here, pixel classification with the bike example, to avoid needing a human to label a heap of images? Um, well, not exactly unsupervised learning, but you can certainly get a sense of where things are without needing these kind of labels. Um, and uh, time permitting, we'll, we'll try and see some examples of how to do that. Um, it's, you're certainly not going to get uh, as, uh, such a quality and such a specific uh, uh, output as what you see here, though. Um, if you want to get this level of segmentation mask, you need um, a pretty good segmentation mask uh, ground truth to work with. And is there a reason we shouldn't deliberately make a lot of smaller data set at sets to step up from in tuning, let's say 64 by 64, 128 by 128, 256 by 256, and so on? Yes, you should totally do that. It works great. Um, try it. Um, I found um, th this idea uh, is something that I first came up with in the course a couple of years ago, and I kind of thought it seemed obvious and just presented it as a good idea, and then I later discovered that nobody had really published this before, and then we started experimenting with it, and it was basically the main trick that we used to, to, to win the ImageNet competition, uh, the Dawnbench ImageNet training competition, um, and we were like, wow, people, this wasn't, oh, only not, not only was this not standard, nobody had heard of it before. Um, there's been now a few papers that use this trick for various specific purposes, but it's still largely unknown. And it um, means that you can train much faster, it generalizes better. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns about exactly like um, how, how small and how big and how much at each level and so forth. Um, um, but uh, I, I guess in as much as it has a name now, it probably does, and I guess we'd call it progressive resizing. Um, I, I found that going much under 64 by 64 tends not to help very much. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great technique and I'd definitely try a few, a few different sizes. What does accuracy mean for pix pixel-wise segmentation? Is it correctly classified pixels divided by the total number of pixels? Yep, that's it. So if you imagined each pixel was a separate, you know, object you're classifying, it's exactly the same accuracy. Um, and so you actually um, can um, just pass in accuracy um, as your metric. Um, but in this case, um, we actually don't. Um, we've created a, a new metric called um, accuracy canvid. And the reason for that is that when they labeled the um, images, Sometimes they labeled a pixel as a uh, void. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. Maybe it was some that they didn't know, or somebody felt that they'd made a mistake, or whatever. But some of the pixels are void. And in the Canvid paper, they say when you're reporting accuracy, you should remove the void pixels. Um, so um, we've created an accuracy Canvid. So all metrics take um, the actual output of the neural net, that's the input to the, to this is what they call the input, because it's the input to the metric, and the target, i.e. the labels you're trying to predict. Um, so we then basically create a, a mask, so we look for the places where the target is not equal to void. Um, and then we just take the uh, input, uh, do the argmax as per usual, just the standard accuracy argmax, but then we just grab those that are not equal to the void code, we do the same for the target, and we take the mean, okay? So it's, it's just a standard accuracy. It's almost exactly the same as the accuracy source code we saw before uh, with the addition of this mask. So it, this, this quite often happens that, that the particular Kaggle competition metric you're using or the particular way your organization, you know, scores things or whatever, there's often like little tweaks you have to do um, and it, it, this is how easy it is, right? And so, as you'll see, to do this stuff, the main thing you need to know pretty well is how to do basic um, 
mathematical operations in PyTorch. Um, so that's just something you kind of need to practice. I've noticed that most of the examples and most of my models result in a training loss greater than the validation loss. What are the best ways to correct that? I should add that this still happens after trying many variations on number of epochs and learning rate. Okay, good question. So remember from last week, if your training loss is higher than your validation loss, then you're underfitting. Okay, it definitely means that you're underfitting. Um, you want your training loss to be lower than your validation loss. Um, if you're underfitting, um, you can train for longer. Uh, you can train, at a, uh, train the last bit at a lower learning rate. Um, um, but if you're still underfitting, then you're going to have to uh, decrease regularization. And we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so in the second half of this uh, part of the course, we're going to be talking quite a lot about regularization. Uh, and uh, specifically how to avoid overfitting or underfitting by using regularization. Um, if you want to skip ahead, we're going to be learning about um, weight decay, dropout, and data augmentation will be the key things that we'll be talking about. Um, okay. Um, for segmentation, um, we don't just create a convolutional neural network. We, we, we can, um, but actually a architecture called UNET um, turns out to be better. And actually, um, the, uh, let's find it. Okay, so this is what a UNET looks like, um, and this is from the um, uh, university website uh, where they talk about the UNET. Um, and so we'll be learning about this both uh, in this part of the course and in part two, uh, if you do it. Uh, but basically, um, this bit down on the left-hand side is what a normal convolutional neural network looks like. It's something which starts with a bigger, big image and gradually makes it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually you just have one prediction. Um, what a unit does is it then takes that and makes it bigger and bigger and bigger again. Um, and then it takes uh, every stage of the downward path and kind of copies it across, and it creates this U-shape. Um, it um, was originally actually created uh, or, or published as a biomedical image segmentation method, but it turns out to be useful for far more than just biomedical image segmentation. So it was presented at um, MICI, which is the main uh, um, medical imaging conference, and uh, as of just yesterday, it actually just became the uh, most cited paper of all time uh, from that conference. So it's been incredibly useful, over 3,000 citations. Um, you don't really need to know any of the details at this stage. All you need to know is if you want to create a, um, a segmentation model, you want to be t saying learner.createUnit um, rather than create CNN. Um, but you pass it the normal stuff, the data bunch, an architecture, and some metrics, okay? So um, having done that, everything else works the same. You can do the yellow finder, find the uh, slope, um, train it for a while, watch the accuracy go up, um, save it from time to time, unfreeze, uh, probably wanna go about 10 less, so it's still going up, so probably 10 less than that. So 1e neg 5 comma LR over 5, train a bit more, um, and there we go, right? Now, um, here's something interesting. You can, uh, learn.recorder is where we keep track of what's going on during training, and that's got a number of nice methods, one of which is plot losses, and this plots your training loss and your validation loss. And you'll see quite often, they actually go up a bit before they go down. Why is that? That's because you can also plot your learning rate over time, and you'll see that your learning rate goes up and then it goes down. Why is that? Because we said fit one cycle, and that's what fit one cycle does. It actually makes the learning rate start low, go up, and then go down again. Why is that a good idea? Well, to find out why that's a good idea, let's first of all look at a really cool um, project done by uh, Jose Fernandez Portal during the week, 
uh, he took our gradient descent uh, demo notebook and um, actually plotted uh, the weights um, over time, uh, not just the um, ground truth and model over time. And he did it for a few different learning rates. And so remember, we had two weights. We were doing basically y equals ax plus b, or in his nomenclature here, y equals w naught x plus w1. And so we can actually look and see over time what happens to those weights. And we know this is the correct answer here, right? So at a learning rate of 0.1, it kind of like slides on in here, and you can see that it takes a little bit of time to get to the right point, and you can see the, the loss improving. Um, at a higher learning rate of 0.7, you can see that the um, ground truth, the model jumps to the ground truth really quickly. And you can see that the weights jump straight to the right place really quickly. What if we have a learning rate that's really too high? You can see it takes a very, very, very long time to get to the right point. Or if it's really too high, it diverges. Okay, so you can see here why getting the right learning rate is important. When you get the right learning rate, it really zooms in to the best spot very quickly. Now, as you get closer to the final spot, um, something interesting happens, which is that you really want your learning rate to decrease, right? Because you're kind of, you're getting close to the right spot, right? And what actually happens So what actually happens is, I can only draw 2D, sorry. Um, you don't generally actually have some kind of loss function surface that looks like that. Um, remember there's lots of dimensions, but it actually tends to kind of look like bumpy, like that, right? And so you kind of want a learning rate that's like high enough to jump over the bumps, right? But then once you get close to the middle, you know, once you get close to the, the best answer, you don't want to be just jumping backwards and forwards between bumps. So you really want your learning rate to go down so that as you get closer, you take smaller and smaller steps. So that's why it is that we want our learning rate to go down at the end. Now this idea of decreasing the learning rate during training has been around forever. And it's just called learning rate annealing. But the idea of gradually increasing it at the start is much more recent, and it mainly comes from a guy called Leslie Smith. And if you're in San Francisco next week, actually you can come and join me and Leslie Smith. Uh, we're having a meetup where we'll be talking about this stuff, um, so come along to that. Um, uh, what Leslie uh, discovered is that if you gradually increase your learning rate, what tends to happen is that actually Actually, what tends to happen is that loss function surfaces tend to kind of look something like this. Bumpy, 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 flat. Bumpy, 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 bumpy. Something like this, right? They have flat areas and bumpy areas. And if you end up in the bottom of a bumpy area, that, that solution will tend not to generalize very well because you found a solution that's it's good in that one place, but it's not very good in other places. Where else, if you found one in the flat area, it probably will generalize well, because it's not only good in that one spot, but it's good kind of around it as well. If you have a really small learning rate, it'll tend to kind of plod down and stick in these places, right? But if you gradually increase the learning rate, then it'll kind of like jump down, and then as the learning rate goes up, it's gonna start kind of going up again like this, right? And then the learning rate's now gonna be up here, it's gonna be bumping backwards and forwards, and eventually the learning rate starts to come down again, and so it'll tend to find its way to these flat areas. So it turns out that gradually increasing the learning rate is a really good way of helping the model to explore the whole function surface and try and find areas where both the loss is, is low and also um, it's, it's not bumpy, because if it was bumpy, it would get kicked out again. And so this allows us to train at really high learning rates, 
So it tends to mean that we solve our problem much more quickly and we tend to end up with much more generalizable solutions. So if you call plot losses and find that it's just getting a little bit worse and then it gets a lot better, you found a really good maximum learning rate. So when you actually um, call fit one cycle, you're not actually passing in a learning rate, you're actually passing in a maximum learning rate. And if it's kind of always going down, particularly after you unfreeze, that suggests you could probably bump your, your learning rates up a little bit because you really want to see this kind of shake. It's going to train faster and generalize better. Just, just a little bit, right? And you'll tend to particularly see it in the validation set. The orange is the validation set, right? And again, the difference between kind of knowing the theory and being able to do it is looking at lots of these pictures, right? So like after you train stuff, type learn.recorder. and hit tab and see what's in there, right? And particularly the things that start with plot and start getting a sense of like, what are these pictures looking like when you're getting good results? And then try making the learning rate much higher, try making it much lower, more epochs, less epochs, and get a sense of what these look like. So um, in this case, um, we used a size in our transforms of the original image size over two. Uh, these two slashes in Python means an integer divide, okay, because obviously we can't have half pixel amounts in our sizes. So integer divide divided by two. And we used a batch size of eight, and I found that fits on my GPU. It might not fit on yours. Uh, if it doesn't, you can just decrease the batch size down to four. Um, and this isn't really solving the problem because the problem is to segment all of the pixels, not half of the pixels. So I'm going to use the same trick that I did last time, which is I'm now going to put the size up to the full size of the source images, uh, which means I now have to halve my batch size, otherwise I run out of GPU memory. And I'm then going to set um, uh, my learner. I can either say learn.data equals my new data, or I actually found I had a lot of trouble with kind of GPU memory, so I generally restarted my kernel, came back here, created a, a new learner, and loaded up the weights that I saved last time. Uh, but the key thing here being that this learner now has the same weights that I had here, but the data is now the full image size. So I can now do an LR find again, uh, find an area where it's kind of, you know, well before it goes up. So I'm going to use one index three and fit some more. And then unfreeze and fit some more. And you can go learn.show results to see how your predictions compare to the ground truth. And you've got to say, they really look pretty good. Not bad, huh? So how good is pretty good? Uh, an accuracy of, of 92.15. Um, the best paper I know of for segmentation uh, was a paper called the uh, 100 Layers Tiramisu, uh, which developed a, a, a uh, convolutional dense net came out about two years ago. So after I trained this today, I went back and looked at the paper to find their state-of-the-art accuracy. Here it is. And I looked it up, and their best was 91.5, and we got 92.1. So I gotta say, when this happened today, I was like, wow. I, I, I don't know if better results have come out since this paper, but I remember when this paper came out and it was a really big deal. I was like, wow, this, this is an exceptionally good segmentation result. Like when you compare it to the previous bests that they compared it to, it was a big step up. And so like in last year's course, we spent a lot of time in the course re-implementing the 100 layers tiramisu. And now with our totally default fast AI class, I'm easily beating this. Um, and I also remember this I had to train for hours and hours and hours, uh, where else today's I trained in minutes. So we, we've, this is a super strong architecture for segmentation. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna promise that 
this is the definite state of the art today because I haven't done a complete literature search to see what's happened in the last two years, but it's certainly um, beating um, the, the world's best approach the last time I looked into this, which was um, in last year's course, basically. And so these are kind of just all the little 